So typically I have maybe with my notes, uh, not quite, but about, about 50% to 60% of the words I have on this notepad for this message. So forgive me if we go over 40, 45 minutes and get into that hour range. I hope we don't, but uh, if we do, stay with me as this chapter is one of the heavies. You know, judges should probably come with a warning label on the front of it. You're getting into some crazy passages, uh, difficult sections, and really it just kind of starts. Uh, well, I mean, some of the stuff's been pretty wild already, but you know, that's just the warm up because Judges 11 and then moving on into Samson and on to the Levite and some other things I'll mention once we get there. Uh, it's, it's some intense topics and situations that come up in the book of Judges. Remember, it's the book of failure. And, and we're looking for the deliverer to come and make things right. So last week we saw in Judges chapter 10 that uh, after 45 years of peace with Tola and Jair, they're, they're, they went headlong into sin. The children of Israel just, you know, it's as if they couldn't wait and they ran so into it that they began worshiping all the gods back in chapter 10, verse 6, of all the nations around them, these ones and those ones and every other one they could find and get their hands on. The idolatry became so abundant and rampant and Israel was crying out because God let them go into the oppression. And it's that cycle of sin and then servitude, right? Sin and then servitude. You are a slave to that which you obey, to that which you pursue. You become a slave to that, as Adam and Eve became really a slave to sin as they obeyed the serpent. So they became slaves to the nations around them, and particularly the Ammonites, not the Amorites, two different people groups. If you read this, you'll get super confused at first, and eventually you, you have to sort it all out. The Ammonites, um, who are descendants from actually Lot, Abraham's nephew. So the Ammonites were oppressing Israel. They occupied the eastern side of the Jordan where the two and a half tribes were, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of uh, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So they're occupying that land that's east of the Jordan while making raids across the Jordan and little sucker punches here and there and taking, uh, taking produce or taking whatever and just harshly oppressing the people. And if you wanted to hear that, that last week, it, I shared on that. And so they cry out. You know, sin leads to servitude. Servitude leads to supplication, crying out for help. And crying out for help, God hears and God sends a deliverer or a savior, which is the term they have for judge here. So uh, I just want to pray briefly and then we get into chapter 11, verse 1. Father, do bless this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Judges chapter 11. I approach it with fear and uh, I approach it with respect, God that it is in your holy word. We pray that you'd help us to rightly divide it. We pray that you'd help us to look to our Savior Jesus at the end of it. In your name we pray, amen. Jephthah, verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, Jephthah, never mind the spelling of his name, it's hard to say. Look at the spelling there. The Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman, a foreigner. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. So here we have this introduction to him. It is Jephthah. His name means he opens. Okay, and sounds like everything's closing on around him, but this is his name. And he's the son of Gilead, and some say, well, he's the son of the people of Gilead, or the son of this man named Gilead himself. And so Gilead is an ancestral town named by the original Gilead, and, and so there would be others with the same name and so forth. But we know that he's the son of a foreign prostitute or a harlot, and this brings great shame upon him. When his half-brothers, or these brothers from Gilead, grow up, they, they drive him out. And it appears he was raised there in Gilead, in his father's house, until this time that they drive him out. And that would include the leaders of the city, because in the 
conversation as it goes. Later, you'll see that leaders of the city were part of this, you're out of here, you're not allowed back in sort of thing. So they said, you have no inheritance among us. No inheritance among us. Outcast. We read that Jephthah did not or did leave, and he lives in Tob, which is this uh, wilderness area, separate from the, the commonwealth, and, and he's kind of on a, a far boundary, if you will. And so it's an unsafe location. And worthless men formed a band of raiders around him as their leader. And this may be that they were hired to protect towns, they were hired as mercenaries, it may be that they were raiding the people of Ammon and Philistine and so forth, kind of like David. And when David was cast out of Jerusalem and he was out living amongst the Philistines in the strongholds, uh, the same thing was sort of going on. So it can remind us of that. But Jephthah is an outcast. He's humble and uh, he's got broken beginnings. But God calls him a mighty man of valor. Remember that with Gideon, you mighty man of valor hiding in the wine press? And there's a contrast between the circumstance he's in and this character, because his circumstance is not very good. And yet, he's called a mighty man of valor. By no choices he made, he is in this place. He didn't choose to whom it would be his parents, you know, etc. Like, he, he's, these are circumstances out of his control, and he is labeled by his society and judged, and they have prejudice against him, you know, as, as though he himself was some embodiment of shame. And any one of these guys could have gone and done the same act as his father had done that put him in this place, but he's the fruit of it, and they hate the fruit of their sin. They hate seeing it on someone else, and so they cast him out. They give him a social stigma, and it's no fault of his own but he's cast out, and God calls him this mighty man of valor or honor. So around him, by all people, they're looking, shame, shame, you know, that's what you represent, you know, and scarlet letter or whatever, and yet here, God calls him a mighty man of valor. And the world often judges uh, people by their misfortunes uh, or, or appearances rather than the true character, and God is the one who calls the things that are not as though they are, though. That, that the barren will have more children than the married wife. That the, 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 you know, the field that is, that is parched is going to produce much and so forth. God sees more. And there's hope in him. You know, the past and the labels and the harms others have done to you and the words of judgment that they bring or just the world's condemnation do not determine your destiny. Jephthah has somehow managed to preserve his courage, preserve his dignity in the midst of this, and we could ask how. And I would say we'll see that he is a worshiper of God. You know, the poor and terrible things that happen to him, God is going to use to bring forth good and build his character. And so difficult circumstances and things that are beyond our control, especially things from our childhood or past wrongs that have been done to us, what do we do with them? Typically, we let them really embitter us, don't they? Don't we? We let them mold our current character rather than giving them to the Lord and letting the Lord mold our character, who can use all things for the good for us because he loves us and we love him. So from Jeff, Jephthah's example, we can see clearly, though, they do not have to determine who we are. And there's a picture of Christ in all of that, of course. Now, this is the man God was preparing as he goes from outcast marauder to really a national patriot and hero of his day. So verse 4, it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. We need somebody. So verse 6, then they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, do you not hate me and, ex and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Verse 8, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned again to you now that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. By the way, you could take verse 7 and 8 and really make that a picture of Christ and our need for him and our response saying, we, we have turned to you now. We need your help. We're oppressed and we need your help. 
Verse 9, so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord, Jehovah, delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. We're making this deal before God. And Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Mizpah being that central city or capital of the area of Gilead. Um, so we have their need is, is presenting a change of tune, really. And they're like, who is there? Is there someone? Oh, we know a guy who knows guerrilla warfare on the edges of Ammon, and he goes out there and he fights, and he's clearly a leader, and um, I think God put it in their heart, because if you look back at chapter 10, verse uh, 17 and 18, let's just read 18 for sake of time, the people, the leaders of Gilead said to one another, who is the man who will begin to fight against the people of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. It's kind of like you've got Goliath in the valley and the Philistines. It's like, is anybody going to go fight this guy? And everybody says, no, no one's going to go fight this giant or no one's going to go fight Ammon in this case. And so they're like, there is someone. Do we go get him? We don't like him. We've cast him out. Should we go get him? Finally, they humble themselves and they go get him. And they're like, we need you. We, they retrieve him and request his leadership. And Jephthah noticed, though, his awareness that it is God who is doing the work of deliverance. In verse 9, Jephthah said to the elders, and the Lord delivers them to me. If someone's going to deliver them, it's going to be the Lord. It's not going to be me. That does it. Okay? And uh, there is clearly, by the way, both the civil and religious ceremonial presence, uh, the priesthood and the civil leadership were there to recognize God, the ultimate overseer there of Israel, and uh, recognize this deal. Verse 10, the elders said to Jephthah, yes, Jehovah will be a witness. And, and then verse 11, they spoke all these words before Jehovah in Mizpah. So this covenant agreement is made before God between the leaders of Gilead and Jephthah, and he will become the head of state. And you would likely have to have the priests there uh, and the civil leaders to do that. So, and it's not that Jephthah is greedy for position. I don't see that, but maybe he knew something growing up. Maybe God had spoken to him, but you know, he will need to, to lead them. He's gonna need the Lord. <laughs> You know, it, or else it's going to become another thing like chapter 9 and Abimelech's story. Just people gathering someone else to prop them up just to, and they don't, just to use them and so forth. The Lord needs to be in this for, for any good to come out of it. And here he is coming from a place of being an outcast to becoming a, a true patriot. You know, and, he's, and, and he already has a name for himself. You know, and is he really out to correct that and so forth when they call upon him? I think he's already found his confidence in God, not what people think about him. But Jephthah could have responded very differently. He could have turned right away from them. No, I'm not coming to help you guys. You guys kicked me out, and now you want my help. Forget you. You know, I'm done with you. Like, he could have really turned on them. And, and yet, he doesn't let his own hurt get in the way of God's calling. He doesn't let his own pain and frustration get in the way of the things God may want to do. And so he, wants, he becomes a blessing to them. He doesn't return reviling for reviling or cursing for cursing or evil for evil. He returns blessing for cursing. And he is the type of friend that you would want. And he is, he's coming in there and it's no I told you so's and all this other stuff that he could have laid upon them. But he is responding to God, I believe, and responding to the love of God. And he's responding to, to his love of Israel as a nation and a people. We can, we'll find out he is, he's very astute in terms of the history and knowledge of Israel. That's why I don't think as he was a raider out in the hills in the wilderness country, he ever touched Israel. I think he was uh, fighting against other tribes and other, other nations and so forth. So... You know, there's something noble and amazing about how he isn't licking his wounds and, and wanting to return that evil. So laying down his own prejudice while they're the ones that are prejudiced. That's hard to do. And, and so, 
he knows who he is despite they're always missing that. And by the way, verse 7 again, uh, it says, did you not hate me? Hate me. You guys hated me and expelled me. Not a just cause because of something he'd never done from his father's house. No inheritance. Why have you come now? Well, this is why we've come. He's like, okay. And, and maybe he was in line to be the next leader or something like that, and they cast him out and so forth, and they have this whole thing going on. But again, this could just as easily be said by Jesus to most of us, that did you not hate me and expel me from your house and your life? Why have you come to me now since you're in distress? <laughs> this is why because we need help, we need salvation. So here Jephthah now is going to have a conversation via writing or texting or something here with the king of Ammon, verse 12. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon saying, why or what do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? He takes personal position Though he knows it's not him, he's representing as the head of state, the nation, and everyone else. So he's putting himself in the forefront of the fray. And that's what our Lord does always. But, you know, his attempt first is to make peace by, by showing that there was no just cause for the quarrel. What business or what is the reason for your quarrel that you have? What's this all about? And... It's wise. First, talk to them. Find out some facts. Courteously, courteously you know, ask, what's going on? Why, why are you doing this? And so, verse 13, we have a response. And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah. The note comes back. Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt. From the Arnon as far as the Jabbok. These are streams, tributaries uh, off the Jordan. Anyways, and to the Jordan... So there's a borderline south, north, east, and west. Now, therefore, restore those lands peaceably. Restore those lands peaceably. Give us your land. So here's the king of Ammon saying, you know, it's really ours. And when Israel came out of Egypt, they took our land unjustly. So Jephthah's response, we'll read it all at once, verse 14 through 28. Here we go. So Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let me pass through your land, but the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner, they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. Just let us pass through, we're going to Canaan. And they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom, descendants of Lot, and the land of Moab, uh, came to the east side of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, please let us pass through your... Now, these are the Amorites, not the Ammonites. Let us pass through your land in peace. Or, uh, in, sorry, and into our place. Verse 20, But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together, encamped in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the lands of the Amorites, who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territories of the Amorites from the Arnon to Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. There it is, the compass directions. Verse 23, And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people. Should you then possess it? Will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God, and that's Jehovah again, in all these places, our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. Um, no, actually, well, I'll, I'll finish reading it here to 25 and to 28. And now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? 
While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages and Aror and in its villages and in all the cities along the bank of the Arnon for 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? Therefore, I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, Jehovah, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. So great diplomacy, really. He's seeking peace, and the other king says, yeah, no, let's do this peaceably. Totally agree, just give us your stuff, give us your land. Uh, then we'll be at peace, right? Let's make for peace, land for peace. Ever heard of that before? Um, so verse 14 through 28 really shows Jeph Jephthah's knowledge and response of the situation. And he, he's getting all the facts and presenting all the facts. And really, they're great points. And, and if you were really into the traveling and the history and looking at the numbers in Deuteronomy, you would, you would recognize a lot of what's going on there. I mean, Sihon and these guys were vicious. They were so evil. God actually wanted them destroyed. Og and, and Bashan, these guys were so wicked and that, you know, they, they would not let the children of Israel pass through. And that's where you have Balaam with Moab, the Moabites, and Balaam is, is prophesying evil against God's people, or oh, God won't let him do that, excuse me, and so forth. And, and so he entices the women to seduce them. And anyway, all of that stuff going on in the book of Numbers. And um, Jephthah responds to this king's appeal to give us your land for peace. And he basically tells them, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the people of Ammon. Israel gained possession of the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. The Amorites took it from the Ammonites, okay? And they wouldn't let us through. And when we defeated them in battle, annihilated them, because of God's hand, it became ours. So it was justly taken from the Amorites, who are the ones who took it previously from the Ammonites. God dispossessed the Amorites and gave the land to Israel, never the Ammonites. And he brings up the, the Jehovah, and then he brings up right away there that punch, verse, verse 23 and then 24. Will you not possess whatever Chemosh, your God, the God of the national god of Moab that the Ammonites have adopted here, your God would give you, if he wants you to have it, and he's your God, appeal to him for it, and he'll give it to you, right? So the spiritual warfare and battle is going on there. And Israel has held this land for 300 years. Someone did the dates and says 319 years. Um, and all that time, why didn't you go after the Amorites? Israel has had it for 300 years. And all that time, you wanted it so badly, why didn't you go and fight the Amorites? When they, who were the ones who actually took it from you? We're the one that fought the Amorites. Anyways, many great points. Uh, if you really wanted it, you would have done something about it decades ago. And, and he attempts to settle it. Jephthah knows his history and the history of Israel. So many points in this, it's all historical. Deuteronomy chapter two, throughout there. Deuteronomy chapter 13, chapter 14, pretty much all of Deuteronomy 20, almost verbatim a lot of it. Deuteronomy chapter 20, or numbers, excuse me, 13, 14, 20, and 21, numbers, and Deuteronomy two. So land dispute. You know, some of the land that they're disputing over is in dispute to this day, the land east of the Jordan, and only by now, Israel's held the land for how long? 300, 300 years? No, 3,500 years they were in there. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, 1947? No, no, no. 3,500 years is when they originally had that possession. 3,500 years. Okay, you're not going to find a people group that have existed that long, save the Egyptians and a few others. But anyway, here you have... Uh, some points there that he gives. Jephthah being very diplomatic, seeking to make peace. They don't really want facts. You know, at this point about Chemosh and your God and so forth, verse 28, the king of the people of Ammon didn't heed the words with Je which Jephthah sent him. He wanted war. You know, he just wanted it. And, and he doesn't respond to reasonable logic. He doesn't respond to, to history. He doesn't respond to the facts. He, regardless, is, is ready for war. And, you know, everyone would like to think that their cause is just, 
and they may bring up an argument at the beginning, but when you calmly and courteously present facts and bring as many as you can to the table and sort through them so you can find some fairness, some people just don't want that. That wasn't their motive to begin with. They, they, they ultimately show their true colors that they didn't care about that, that what is leading them is lust and covetousness and envy and pride. That's where wars come from among you, James says. It's not truly because you want fairness. It's not truly because you're seeking to, to see justice done. The Ammonites are filled with evil there, and, and their cause is not just, and that has been revealed. And so war is inevitable. Jesus said, though, blessed are the peacemakers, those who make for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God, those who make for peace. But when war comes to you, regardless... What do you do then? Be on your guard. Stand and be a person of valor, seeking the Lord first and his victory. So here is victory in a vow beginning in verse 29. Then the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, God's spirit, came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he advanced toward the people of Ammon. So he is back in his own area there. And I'll, I'll pause after verse 29. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. You know, we, we see that with Gideon and Othniel earlier, the first judge. And we see this with Samson in the in coming chapters here, um, that the Spirit of God comes upon him. He was chosen for the work, empowered for the work ahead. And, and he's gathering the forces to go fight. And God gives him extraordinary strength and power and wisdom to go to battle with the people of Ammon. And I like how it says there, he advanced at the end of verse 29. He advanced toward the people of Ammon. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon man, us, his church, there is an advancement of God's kingdom. There's an advancement in the spiritual. There's an advancement of God's work uh, confronting his enemies. We go forward with a spiritual progress and a spiritual strength. And if there's been a lethargy, if there's been a, a sleepiness and so forth, we need that. And we need to stand in faith and then, and then go forward at God's command and in his strength and in his spirit. So he makes a vow in verse 30, uh, anticipating the victory. Jephthah made a vow to Jehovah and said, if you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, Jehovah's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So we have this vow that he makes, and I believe it's clearly well-intentioned, but it turns out to be a rash vow made hastily. And we shouldn't attempt to manipulate or uh, prove ourselves to God by making any kind of vow. You know, you don't want to provoke the Lord. The Lord doesn't need us to make any vows. He doesn't need us to prove ourselves. You know, and especially if there's any manipulation in, in a vow. It's like, okay, God, if you do this, I'll, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. It's like, well, God, you know, He's going to continue in his plan. He, he's always going to continue in his plan of redemption, in his love, in his... It's, that's what grace is about, by the way. It's not a works-based relationship we have with him. And so, as God continues in that, who are we to try to seek, seek to manipulate God to do things our way? My basic point is this. God, God already has his way. And, and we don't need... He doesn't need our help necessarily, especially with his plans. And uh, we need to simply obey his way and what he's doing. And, and we don't need to do anything like this, what's being exemplified here. Um, you know, it, it does seem Jephthah thought this would be an appropriate response to worship you know, God for victory and so forth. If this happens, maybe it's a response, I want to worship you, you know, you, you worship at all times anyways, so I'm not sure what, what is going on here in his motive. And now this idea of whatever comes out of my house, and, and people always joke about that, what did you expect to come out of your house? Like a, like a cow? You know, how often does that happen? Or, or, you know, a sheep? They live in your house or something? So maybe he's talking about, 
the, the house and the courtyard and the gates or something like that, and whatever comes out and meets me first. And then some people look at this word and in, in verse 31, when I return in peace shall be the Lord's. And, but some people look at that and say that could be the word or in the Hebrew grammar. I'm not a specialist in that, so I don't really know. It's, it could say, or I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So whatever comes out of my house, whether it's one of his servants or something like this, is he's maybe anticipating, or it's, it's an animal, it's gonna be burnt offering. If it's a servant, it's, they're gonna be dedicated to the Lord, and we'll look into that shortly. Um, human sacrifice was strictly forbidden by the law. We'll look at that. But Jephthah has demonstrated a great knowledge and grasp of scripture so far. He is quoting chunks of Deuteronomy and Numbers, which we're not going to do, you know. Uh, but he, he understands some of that more than we do. He's, he's quoting the history. It's like when you read, you know, Acts chapter 7, and, and there's Stephen, and he, he's just like, he's given the history of Israel, just, just given it, you know. And you're like, whoa, you know, it's awesome. So... Um, there is a condemnation of human sacrifice throughout the books that he's quoting from. So he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 2, and it's Deuteronomy chapter 12 that harshly condemns human sacrifice. Did he just miss that part and skip over then to Numbers? You see what I'm saying? In Leviticus, which is directly next to these in the Pentateuch, in the first five books, the Law of Moses, the book, the book of Leviticus is very clear, very clear. He knows about burnt offerings and so forth. And we'll get into that. Let's first finish the war here, verse 32 and 33. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and Jehovah delivered them into his hands, and he defeated them from Aror as far as Mineth, 20 cities, into these locations with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. So even someone with the Spirit of the Lord can still make a rash vow. God's not controlling people, and they don't become possessed by God's Spirit or something like that. That's not it at all. You know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and yet he still has his choices that he's going to make and say and so forth. And so there's this great victory that is won. And, and Jephthah, to his credit, he overcame great bitterness and rejection and led his people in victory. You know, the people that hated him, and he led them in victory. Isn't that awesome? It does not speak to our Savior. You know, and, and he, he was there for them in their great moment of need. What a patriot to overlook all these petty things so that he could go forward in unity for the purposes of God. Now, verse 34, here's this difficult vow he made, and now he's going to fulfill it because the victory is won. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child to make it worse. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter. So this great victory is now super, you know, soured by this event. You have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to Jehovah, that I, and I cannot go back on it. You can't? Why not? I cannot go back on it, he says in verse 35. Very difficult. Sincere man, but made a foolish vow. You know, and, and you are to keep your word. He says, I cannot go back. Because oaths, it was, it was a law to keep them. In the chapter 30 of Numbers, and there's a yeah, sermon on that on the, on the church website, the chapter 30 of Numbers is all about keeping your vows to God. Keeping your vows to God. And, and you make a vow, you shall not break it. It's, it's, it's solid there. And he says, I've given my vow. I've given my word to the Lord. Well, how would he know that unless he knew Numbers chapter 30? where he would also know about the sacrifice that's not allowed. Anyways, and, um, you know, I think we've all been there. We've said things we've regretted saying. Once you let words out of your mouth, you can't really, you know, go grab those back. I didn't really say that. You know, you know now, some, when you text, sometimes you didn't really say that. I mean, that happens a lot. It's like, wow, how did that come out like that? Why does it think I'm trying to spell things that way? And these, oh, maybe it's because I'm an, an uneducated man or something. I don't know. But... Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25 is, is a scripture that's always stuck with me. 
It's a snare for a man to devote something rashly as holy. It's a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy. And afterward, to reconsider his vows. Yeah, this is the Lord's, and, and, and I'm going to serve God. And then you don't show up for it. And you don't, you know. So it's, or, or to reconsider it, it's, it's always, it's a snare. And um, there, there was times I was involved with, with church leadership and church work previous to this ministry. And, you know, I remember, I remember giving my yes to something I never agreed with as a board member in a church and an organization. And I, and I fought with it for five months. And it was something, um, some, it wasn't doctrinal, but it was something I didn't think the Lord wanted in the church. And, and we fought over that, and, and it's like every, every elders meeting, every board meeting ends up being, this comes up again, and I'm just like, and finally I remember talking with my wife, I'm like, I'm so tired of this, fine. And I would try to reason through it in my own head. I love these guys, and maybe they're right, or the, you know, and so forth, and there's differences. And, but I remember feeling like, and, and we weren't all in on it or all not. It was just really me and one person. And I just felt like I'm a younger brother of four, four boys. I'm the youngest. And, and boy, I cried uncle a lot growing up. And so I'm like, I'll just cry uncle again. You know, twist my arm. Okay, uncle, I give in. And then I've got to present it as, you know, that's the Lord's. And I remember this scripture really speaking to me, and I journaled about that scripture, you know, where a rash vow becomes a snare to you, because now you're in a position where you either break the vow or continue going forward with it, even though you don't agree with it. What do you do? It's a hard spot to be in. Rather not be in that spot, and you have to weigh which is better, to keep it or repent of making the foolish vow. And if Jeff is so low about this, he should have just humbled himself and said, I repent of this, you know, and, and I'm sorry I'm making foolish vows or something. Who knows? Like, but, you know, at what point do you break a vow? Would it be more sinful to keep it or break it? That's a good question to ask. You know, if a man makes a vow to commit a crime and then goes and commits the crime because he made the vow. Well, the making of the vow to commit a crime is a crime in the first place. Now you've just committed two crimes by saying you'll do it and then going and doing it. How is that any better? It's not relativism based upon our uh, words and our oaths. God has rules and laws and he has principles set forth from the foundation of the universe and we are to abide by those. That's why Jesus culminates the whole of the law and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And if it's not fitting within that, he is the one who defines what love is, we should note, then really, what are we doing and what are we saying and what are we thinking? None of our vows can supersede his laws is what I'm telling you. None of our vows should ever supersede God's heart, God's rules, God's laws. But I made a vow, I'm going to sacrifice my daughter. Really? Well, that was stupid. Repent of your vow. Right? At that point, break it if that's what happened. So, um, Ecclesiastes, for note takers, chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, also speaks of the danger of foolish vows. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 6, and Proverbs 20, verse 25. Christians need to be careful of making vows. Jesus said, rather don't make them. You don't even know what tomorrow, what's going to happen. Just let your yes be yes, let your no be a no. Tomorrow is enough trouble of its own. Live in the day you're in. Love God with all your heart. Go forward. <laughs> it doesn't mean we should never make a vow. They can be good, but we should t they should be taken seriously. And, and when we break them, we just need to repent and keep them. Or if we've broken them for good, then we repent of the foolishness and every way of making the vow. We seek God's release from it and so forth. And there's a lot to say about it. But for sake of time, we need to move forward and talk about this section. Oh, actually, I think our time's up. No, just kidding. Uh, I, was, I was wishing it was. And last night I was procrastinating where I was supposed to be reading more, I was procrastinating. And uh, I was talking to someone on the phone, I was like, no, nah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm procrastinating, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm playing chess, and I'm pro procrastinating. Uh, but then I had to, thank you, Lord, for this passage. Thank you for this scripture. Although it's one that we may want to breeze over, did you know there's probably more ink written about this section than most? You know, there is more 
said about this in commentaries, and I've had my nose in the books all week. And even this morning, I've got three large commentaries sitting on my table and one digital besides. And I'm reading them, and I'm reading them, and I'm reading them. And I've got to come up with the conclusion of the answer. No, I don't. I've just got to honor God, and he knows what went on here. We may not have the answer, but what happened? So let's, let's read verse 35 down here. We, we did uh, verse 35, verse 36. So she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to Jehovah, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. So she takes it seriously too, because Jehovah has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Let's not spoil the celebration. Let's go forward with this vow. Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity. Not my life, my virginity my friends and I. So he said, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. It doesn't describe what exactly he did. She knew no man. It does describe that, which means she never had intercourse was never married, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephth Jephthah, the Gileadite. Okay, so not mourning, but lamenting her lot and what happened in this situation. So some think he really did offer his daughter as a burnt offering. Um, I, I actually don't, up front, think that that's the case. Uh, we can still get along if you do. Um, great commentators, Luther said, yeah, of course, it's plain. Other commentators, Clark, who I, I respect, is, says, no. What do you do? Well, I think we should line up all the commentators that say yes and line up all the commenters that say no, and we should have them fight. You know, that's, that would be a great, you know, see which one God empowers or something. I don't know. But... If he did, clearly it's misguided zeal. God never asked for it. God would never want it. God would never accept it. He asked uh, Abraham to take your son, your only son whom you love, up onto the mountain of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham, whoa. And this is before the Mosaic law, mind you. Takes him up there. And what did God say, though, before he's even going up or as they're going up? And his son asked him, here's the wood for the offering. Where's the, where's the sacrifice? Expecting there to be a goat, a sheep. And he says, the Lord has provided himself an offering. Not only did he, it has a double meaning, not only was it the ram going to be caught in the thicket, but has offered himself as the offering. There will only be one human who is sacrificed ever that can take away the sin. And that would be our Lord Jesus. And we'll get to that. Now, the whole Old Testament displays an absolute revulsion of human sacrifice. Absolute revulsion. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Deuteronomy 12, 31, Deuteronomy 18, as well as the judgment of Canaan itself. And these gods who are demanding it of Moloch and, and Shamash and all these who actually receive human sacrifice. Jephthah did not agree with Chemosh. He was one for Jehovah. And here they are in this position now. So they would say, well, Jephthah, you know, he was the son of a foreign harlot. You know, he had to grow up. He had to, he had to live out in Tobe. And he, would have, he was a mixed bag. He was a confused believer. And he had these things, this baggage in there. And he was obviously mixed up with it. Well, you're basically doing, I guess, you know, kind of like what the leaders of Gilead were doing, you know. You're the son of a harlot. You, know, you, you wouldn't have known any better. He had the word of God. He was reading it. He was studying it. You know, every sacrifice to the Lord required that a priest officiate it once Leviticus was instituted. Saul tried to offer one. Remember that? Where's Samuel? He's not here yet. Oh, just go ahead and do it. Oh, no, 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 no. Once Leviticus was instituted, you needed a priest there, and no Hebrew priest would offer a human sacrifice. What did she bewail? Her virginity. And this makes me think she was set aside for tabernacle service. Now, 
the, the, those who oppose that would say, well, no, it's because that was such an important thing and the dignity of a woman was basically to be a mother and that was her honor and so she's bewailing she'll never have honor and so forth. I, I don't think that's good enough, but bewailing her virginity, there were women at the time who were separated for tabernacle service. They were called the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And that's in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8. It's also after, before this event and after this event in 1 Samuel 2, 22. There are principles in Leviticus chapter 27 about people who are separated to God by a vow. People could be vowed to the Lord. Paul took a vow. You know, a Nazarite vow. Have you heard of that one? People could be separated unto the Lord. And uh, they were not required to be sacrificed as animals were, but they were set apart for the service of God in a special way. And I believe she was probably one of the women who were going to be serving at the tabernacle now for life. Samuel was sep separated for life by his mother. We don't think that odd. So what's the difference here? You can think none. That's what you can think. Uh, in UN, sorry for the pun, uh, his daughter and her friends grieved this change of life and they bewailed her virginity is what they bewailed. And it's repeated in the text, verse 37, verse 38, and verse 39. And that makes me think what's going on, the context. By sending his unmarried daughter's only child to serve at the tabernacle. And it really shows how serious Jephthah and his daughter were. He will have no progeny. He, he will never be a grandfather, and he will not see his daughter very often anymore. He doesn't live where the tabernacle is at Shiloh. He, he lives on the other side of the Jordan, and he's got business to take care of there. And meanwhile, think about this. Jephthah is in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, verse 32. How is this man in the hall of faith? The last thing he did was kill his daughter in a detestable, sick offering. Well, you know, I don't know. But he knows the word of God. He's commended for his faith at the end of it. It's not that people can't make mistakes, Samson, and be in the hall of faith. But usually at the end of it, they're walking in faith. So there is a lot of writing on this. Tons of writing. You're welcome to go study it. I know some of you have and some of you like to study. Before you pass judgment on Jephthah, study. There's a lot of information. You can come over and borrow some commentaries. Whichever way we cut it, he does fall short. And next week you'll see that he, he gets in a war with Ephraim and kills 42,000 of Israel. That's not pretty. Not pretty at all. But whichever way you look at it, he is not the perfect deliverer, is he? And we're not looking to Jephthah. Although there is some interesting comparison and correlation and contrast with Jesus. You know, here's a man who was raised up as a deliverer for Israel after 18 years of severe oppression and only rules for six years, bringing peace. Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to rule forever as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And every knee is going to bow, every tongue confess. So follow with me on this conclusion. Jephthah was born from a harlot. Jesus was born from a virgin and accused of the adultery or immorality of the same. Jephthah was sent away and cast out from his own people. Jesus was also not wanted in his own town, a prophet's not welcome, and he was cast out from his people. Jephthah, being an outsider, drew worthless men to himself and led them in raiding the enemy camps. Jesus, being an outsider, you know, suffering outside the gate even, draws outcasts to himself, nobody's in society's eyes, and leads them in the work of God's kingdom. Jephthah, though at first rejected, was finally called upon by his own people to deliver them from their enemies and oppressors. Jesus, though at first rejected, will be called upon. Every knee will bow and tongue confess, but also Israel will look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him. And that so applies to us. Though at first rejected, we return to the Lord, the overseer of our souls, like Peter puts it. Jephthah, when called upon, didn't turn his back on those who needed him. He didn't. Jesus does not refuse to help us 
though many times he has been rejected by us in the past. Jephthah, once accepted, became the head of state and commander of the people before the civil and religious authority. Jesus is the head of his church, and he will become the head of state over not only Israel, but all the nations, governing both over religious and civil matters. Jephthah attempts to make for peace. He does not desire the outcome of bloodshed and war, but will take arms when it arrives and is necessary. Jesus would have for peace, as he is the Prince of Peace, but he's also the King of Kings who will take vengeance on his enemies. Jephthah makes a vow, and the first thing which comes out of his house to greet him upon return and victory will be offered as a worship offering to the Lord. Jesus made many vows, by the way, because he's the only one who could ever keep them all. All right, let your yes be net yes, and every time he said a yes, it was a yes. We will cross over to the other side, you know? Why, why mourn over Lazarus? He's not dead. What? You know? He sleeps. <laughs> and I will come back and receive you to myself. Many vows, many promises we have from God, from Jesus. But he also vowed he will not drink of the wine at that last supper until he sits down at the table when he brings it new, uh, has it new with his friends in the kingdom. Looking forward to that fulfillment. But, you know, his, his yes, he's the only one who will ever and has ever perfectly kept his word. Amen? That is, I think that is just awesome. Jephthah was a man of valor, and Jesus is the man of valor. The Spirit of God came upon Jephthah for his commission. The Spirit of God descended upon Jesus for his. Jephthah rooted the Ammonites. Jesus conquered God's enemies, including ours, of sin and death. Jephthah offered his daughter to the Lord. Jesus did not offer another person as a living sacrifice. He offered himself as a sacrifice and not a worship offering dedicated to God for life. Like where Paul says, uh, he who keeps his virgin does well in Corinthians. Well, he's talking about uh, an unmarried daughter set apart to service of God. Jesus didn't just set apart his daily life and his every moment, but he be did become himself the sin offering upon the cross for our sins. He is the only one, as I said earlier. Jephthah's offering uh, meant, now this what much we know, his daughter would never marry. From the text, we know that. We don't know if she was ever sacrificed uh, physically. But she became like Romans 12.1. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. So, um, she, Jephthah's offering meant she would never marry. Jesus' off, Jesus' offering means that he will marry and have a bride forever, the body of Christ, the church, that's us. This is the stone which the builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. Jephthah was rejected, and he became the chief. Jesus is the rejected one who becomes the chief cornerstone. Let's have the worship team come up. Lord, we thank you that in all ways and so many more, you're, you're a better than a Jephthah. And we look to you, Lord. We, we exalt you. We give you praise. We thank you for being that offering. And, and in that offering, you defeated the enemies. In that offering, you made that open door for reconciliation. Lord, not that we could just be uh, nationalistic with you and have civil laws and external rules, but Lord, you could have our hearts and you could redeem us from sin and we could be truly your bride and we could love you as you love us and respond to your love with our hearts. We thank you, Jesus, for the good news of the gospel and we thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us without hope. We thank you that your words will not return to you void, Lord, but that everything you say will come to pass. And we are looking for so many prophecies to be fulfilled at your return. And we thank you, Jesus, that you're coming back for your bride. We thank you for that promise in John 14, 1 and 2. We thank you, Lord, that you will return and receive us to yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. We thank you, Lord, that you, you desire that we would pray for your return for us, that you'd come save us from the evil day and hour. Lord, we want our lamps full and we desire, Lord, to have 
have a unity with one another and with you and the church. And we just pray, God, that you would, you would help us to walk in humility and love, freeing us from any bitterness of the past, from any, from any overwhelming issue, Lord, from, from those who have harmed us, God. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. And we thank you for the cleansing that you give us and, and ultimately for that, that moment, Lord, when you are gonna so wash us completely pure that there won't remain any more anything of stain or spot or sin or, or harmful thing with us. But body, soul, and spirit, we will be totally whole with you. We look forward to you coming to get us, Lord, and redeeming us. We look forward to all your promises coming to fruition. We, we, God, we just thank you that you are our deliverer. We give you praise this day in Jesus' name. Amen.